Conducting a hazard analysis can be confusing, especially if you're doing it for the first time. And if you don't do it just right, you'll end up with a snowball effect of problems later on as you go through the remaining steps of developing your HACCP plan. This video provides some tips and clarifications on conducting a hazard analysis. The first step is to identify all of the hazards that could be present in the ingredients and the packaging materials. And then we'll go through the same process and identify all of the hazards that could be present at each of the processing steps. Don't worry about listing all of the pathogens that could be there, just list the main ones of concern. So don't list 20 pathogens that could be there. In most cases, you'll just find that there's one, two, or maybe three that are highly likely to be present. The reason for first identifying the hazards involved in the ingredients and materials is so that as we add processing steps to our hazard analysis, we can know exactly what hazards are associated with those ingredients and materials as they are added to the process. The next clarification is that once you've listed that a hazard is present in one of these processing steps, do not carry that hazard down as you identify hazards in subsequent processing steps. For example, if you identify that a hazard appears when the ingredients are mixed, you don't have to mention that hazard again in subsequent processing steps, such as cooking, cooling, and packaging. Moving on to the question of whether the hazards are reasonably likely to occur. One of the common mistakes I see is folks not assuming that they have effective prerequisite programs. Effective prerequisite programs make many of the hazards not reasonably likely to occur. And this emphasizes the concept of the food safety pyramid. A food safety management system such as HACCP won't be effective unless you have good prerequisite programs. So count on many of your prerequisite programs for controlling many of the food safety hazards that could appear. The next clarification is how to answer the question of whether a hazard is reasonably likely to occur. We answer this question by first considering the severity of illness that someone could get after consuming the product. For example, a hazard could be present, but what if it's at such a low concentration that someone would never get sick? In this case, the severity of health hazard would be so low that we wouldn't consider it reasonably likely to occur. Next, we consider the likelihood of occurrence of the food safety hazard. And we base this decision on past experience, epidemiological data, and technical reports. It's fairly common to say hazards are not reasonably likely to occur because you're effectively managing your prerequisite programs. The next step, once we've identified the hazards and evaluated them by answering the question whether they're reasonably likely to occur, is to continue to fill out the table. We need to justify the decision of whether the hazard is reasonably likely to occur and for those hazards that are reasonably likely to occur, we need to list the control measures that will control them. The next clarification is on how to code the hazards. For example, you'll commonly see B1, B2, B3 for biological hazards 1, 2, and 3. Keep in mind that this is only necessary for the hazards that are deemed reasonably likely to occur. So there's no need to number all of the hazards that appear in your hazard analysis. Just do so as you start to fill out your HACCP plan summary form after you've conducted your hazard analysis. Hopefully these tips have been helpful. Next, we'll determine which hazards will be controlled by critical control points.